imeli konferencijos dalyviai, imeli kolegos, tai leisite norėčiau savo pranešimą skaityti anglų kalbą. Kadangi pirmiausia, tai vis dėl turi tarp baudinį konferenciją, šį konferenciją, po antrą tekstą buvau paruošęs anglų kalbą anksčiau, bent didelio dalimi, ir perašyti tų kalbą tiesiog neliko laiko. Tai jeigu jūs atvanosit, aš skaitysiu jau į atveškai. Dabar reiškia pradėti. This conference convenes on an anniversary which marks the single bloodiest day in the history of modern Lithuania. Seventy-five years ago, on October 29, 1941, some 9,200 men, women, and children, nearly a third of the population, Jewish population of Kaunas, were driven to the old Zionist era Ninth Fort, where they were massacred by the Nazis and their accomplices. Only hours before, these people, just as in Dr. Mengele's infamous selections at Auschwitz, had been chosen on the basis of their perceived lack of fitness for work. This great action, or gross action, was the most violent phase of a nearly three-month-long extraordinary blitzkrieg of wholesale extermination, which had begun shortly after the installation of the German civilian administration in late July 1941. The slaughter accelerated during the next month and reached its peak on that October day in Kaunas. Afterwards, the pace of the shootings slackened. By the end of 1941, in the words of Yitzhak Arad, the country's uh, surviving Jews experienced, quote, a long period of relative tranquility, unquote. But the killings carried out by the Nazis and local collaborators had effectively destroyed Lithuania's provincial Jewry portending a final solution in microcosm, although this iconic genocidal euphemism acquired its sinister notoriety only later. The commemorated victims of the Ninth War were, for the most part, city people. Uh, <clears throat> a significant number of urban Jews survived the annihilation of the Jewish communities in the countryside and suffered on the years that followed as exploited labor in the major ghettos of Vilnius Kaupas Chorde. In retrospect, we can see that these inmates were now <coughs> on death row, and in fact, most would not survive the war. I would like to begin my presentation by briefly discussing whether the Holocaust is a singular event from a global perspective, and then attempt to place the genocide of the Jews more precisely within the framework of 20th century European history, especially as it relates to the place where most of the victims of the Shoah perished the notorious bloodlands of Eastern Europe. <clears throat> the theme of this conference implies a comparative approach, so there is a broader question which naturally arises at the outset. What distinguishes the uniqueness uh, of the Holocaust as a historical event from all other mass murders in history? The question of the quote-unquote uniqueness of the genocide of the Jews has raised some sharp debates among historians. The Holocaust certainly represented an extraordinary evil. To make this point, the following features of the genocide are all off-cited as unique. <clears throat> First of all, the magnitude of the slaughter, the mind-boggling cruelty of the perpetrators, the malicious attack on a clearly identified group of people, and in particular, the intent to annihilate an entire community of human beings. If we examine these features separately, the Holocaust as a unique horror is open to some question. Let us limit ourselves to the modern era, bypassing the slaughters of the ancient and medieval world, from Carthage to the Crusades to Genghis Khan, first the problem of scale, magnitude. Until the outbreak of the Nazi-Soviet war in June 1941, the Stalinist death count of defenseless civilians eclipsed the Third Reich's human toll manifold until that time. Other 20th century slaughters, if we take a global perspective, also number in the millions. Consider the legacies of Maoism and Pol Potism. Who was the cruelest of them all? If we look at Cambodia, ISIL, Jihadism, the recent African wars, we will find enough examples of savagery to doubt whether the suffering that the Nazis inflicted on their victims was, by comparison, truly exceptional. <clears throat> 
The Nazis certainly carried the idea of collective guilt to a historic extreme. Individual responsibility was irrelevant. But on this count, a celebrated Soviet journalist once described the Stalinist, the Stalinist attack on the peasantry as, quote, not one of them was guilty of anything, but they belonged to a class that was guilty of everything. Finally, we also see the specter of the intent to annihilate entire communities in the rhetoric, for example, of Pol Pot and ISIL. And finally, during the slaughter of 1994 in Rwanda, perhaps the closest analog to the Holocaust, the Hutu extremists clearly celebrated publicly their goal of total annihilation, which they failed to accomplish only because they lost the war. This should sound familiar to scholars of the Shoah. And numbers do matter. If the deaths inflicted in these various outrages are not significantly different in their quantitative aspect, what is the argument for a morally, ethically meaningful distinction? Discussions of comparative criminality become especially distasteful and lose all moral substance when they degenerate into arguments about which case of targeted mass murder is better or worse. I reject the notion that pointing out the striking similarities of murderous political systems somehow normalizes Nazi crimes or trivializes the Holocaust. My point here is simply that comparative discussions of radical evil on a global scale should be left to the philosophers. We can gain more insight into the theme of our conference by examining the four years of the final solution within the specific context of 20th century European history. Here we see a different picture. The Holocaust emerges as a crime which cannot be dismissed as just another case of mass murder. <clears throat> I had mentioned some of these crimes before. Now, the Nazis were not the first to target Europe's Jews. Confining ourselves to the modern period of pre-Holocaust violence, we can take as examples Wolfgang Panditsky's campaign of the 17th century and the anti-Jewish massacres very large-scale massacres that occurred during the Russian Civil War of 1918 to 21. Some scholars, for example Richard Pipes, have concluded that the attacks on the Jews during the latter conflict foreshadowed the Holocaust. <coughs> However, neither Khmelnytsky's Cossacks nor the various factions of the, the Torah part after the revolution saw themselves waging a Nazi-like total war against the Jewish menace. Jewish communities suffered greatly during outbursts of ethnic hatred, but those conflicts were not principally about the Jews, who once again had become scapegoats in other people's wars. None of these cataclysms rose to the scale and nature of organized violence which obliterated the Jewish communities of Europe during the Second World War, but the essential preconditions for the Shoah were set in motion only with the rise of the Third Reich. The necessary condition for the Nazi slaughter of the Jews was the racialized anti-Semitism, which had emerged in Germany, France, and Austria since the 19th century and matured fully during the Third Reich. Radical political leadership then effectively activated the ide ideological foundations in a program of persecution directed at the targeted group. Raoul Hilberg's seminal study, The Destruction of the European Jews, published in 1961, which actually was the foundation for, for later Holocaust scholarship, outlines the four necessary stages which led to the Shoah, but his methodology can be applied to most mass persecutions, most mass persecutions throughout the 20th century. <clears throat> so first we have, as I mentioned, the ideology itself, which has to be activated in certain specific stages of destruction. The process must begin with the identification of who constitutes the targeted group. Simply put, who is a Jew? In Germany, the solution to this problem was difficult. It involved a protracted legal and bureaucratic process, as a result of which a definitive answer was provided by the infamous racial laws of the 1930s, the so-called Nuremberg Laws. In Eastern Europe, the problem of identification proved much simpler. From the point of view of the persecutor, it makes little sense to simply identify the enemy without taking additional steps. So the organizers of persecution then follow with a policy of expropriation, not just of property, 
but also in the broader sense of the abrogation of rights, thus removing the target population from exercising political, economic, social, and cultural influence. It is then only logical to ask, if the enemy is dangerous, how can he be allowed to live among us? It is only logical then to ask, if the, end, <clears throat> uh, the problem is solved by the concentration or isolation, now physical as well as legal, of the defined victims, either in camps or ghettos, eventually. Thus completing the process of exclusion. In South Africa, the apartheid system mimicked quite well these three phases of activating the racist ideology. However, the Africana leadership never seriously considered the actual destruction of the communities they had targeted as inferior races. We are speaking of the Holocaust today because the Nazis and their accomplices crossed that threshold in 1941. A few words about the mechanism and geography of the destruction. An oft heard, and I think quite simplistic meme or phrase often says that the Nazis, quote, killed the Jews simply because they were Jews. And of quote, you, you, you hear this often, particularly those of you who teach uh, this history to students. In reality, the Nazis killed the Jews not so much for who they were, but for what in their very perverted ideology what the Jews did as a collective. In reality, the Nazis intended to murder all Jews because they believed that as a collective, Jewry was guilty of a historic crime against the Aryan peoples and constituted an ex existential threat to the survival of the German folk. The guilt or innocence of individual Jews, of course, was of no consequence. The intended physical annihilation of an entire people, racial group, the final solution, has no analog in the European experience. The final solution cost almost six million lives. The overwhelming majority of Holocaust victims, at least 95%, were murdered in three ways. <clears throat> Mass shooting operations, <clears throat> suffocation by poison gas, <clears throat> calculated attrition in concentration camps and ghettos. The most notorious sites, as you know, for the mass shooting of Jews are located in Lithuania, in the 9th, 4th, and Ponar, Latvia, Rumuli Forest, Belarus, near Minsk, Ukraine, of course, is famous for Babi Yar, as well as in the Romanian occupied territories in the southeast. The mass execution, executions are associated with the Einsatzgruppen, the mobile killing squads which operated most intensively during the summer and fall of 1941, but also carried out executions at later dates on a lesser scale. More than a quarter of all Holocaust victims perished in this quote-unquote Holocaust by bullets, which is the title of Father Patrick Debois' 2008 published investigation of killing sites in Ukraine. In Western popular narratives, however, the drama of the Holocaust is usually linked to the reality of the death camps, Auschwitz, Sobibor, Treblinka, Majdanek, Belzec, Helno, all of which operated in Reich in Nazi-occupied Poland. Here, victims were brought to the killers, rather than the other way around, via Europe's railroad networks and asphyxiated in gas chambers or in mobile vans. These unique industrialized <coughs> killing operations, initiated by the so-called Operation Reinhardt in 1942, accounted for roughly 40 to 50 percent of the Jews who perished in the Holocaust. Finally, the surviving Jewish population was subjected to prolonged exploitation in ghettos and concentration camps under inhumane conditions purposefully designed to result in their eventual demise through disease and starvation. Furthermore, as the ghettos were dismantled, as the Nazis retreated westward in 1944-45, the inmates were either killed, for example in the infamous children's action in Galnas and then Scholle, or were transported to camps, for example Stutthof, Kloga, Kaiserwald. Disease, hunger and shootings during the death marches and transports killed many who had hitherto survived years of mistreatment. It should be stressed, and I emphasize this, that although the neighbors killing neighbors <coughs> theme has garnered much public attention following the revelations, for example, about Yedvavne, most Holocaust victims did not die as a result of pogroms, horrific as they were. Far more important was the Germans' successful utilization of indigenous, militarized police formations in the slaughter. 
In geographic terms, with the exception of Denmark, Finland, Estonia, and Bulgaria, excluding Macedonia, Bulgaria occupied Macedonia, Jews from all German-occupied and Axis control lands were killed in large numbers. But almost all locales of mass murder are situated here in Eastern Europe, primarily in five countries, Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, Lithuania, and Latvia. I would like to now turn to the situation specifically in Lithuania itself, uh, <clears throat> and ask us whether the paradigm of European-wide destruction that I have described can be applied to what happened here in Lithuania. And let us start at the very beginning. If you speak to people about the Holocaust here in this country, uh, there are some ideas that are repeated very often. One is that the Holocaust began on the first day of the Nazi invasion, June 22nd, and that the killings began even before the arrival of the Germans during the invasion. Well, let us consider this problem. In the 1976 study of the final solution in Lithuania, the noted historian and Holocaust survivor, Yitzhak Harad, outlined three stages of destruction. He wrote an article about the final solution with way on the basis of German documentation. It's published in the Yad Vashem journal. He distinguished uh, these following stages. Uh, as you can see, uh, the, the most intense period of mass carnage from June to November of 1941, selective actions carried out during the exploitation of Jewish labor, December 41 to July 43, Pona is a prime example of this process. And then murders committed during the dissolution of the ghettos uh, from August 43 to July of 1944, including the Nusshole and At that time, Arad depicted the very first part of this process, 23rd June to 3rd July, that's the first 10 or 11 days of this initial, of, of this process, as the time of, quote, murders by the Twains. In his later encyclopedic Holocaust in the Soviet Union, published in 2009, Arad basically applied this chronological uh, framework you see here uh, <clears throat> to the whole of the USSR. <clears throat> and uh, in his view, the anti-Jewish violence of the pogroms, which erupted in the western borderlands of the USSR at the outset of the German invasion, was a distinctive regional episode in the history of the Holocaust without parallel in the rest of Europe. Some words about the pogroms in the first week of the war. The first mass killing of Jews in Lithuania was not a pogrom. It was carried out by the Tilsit branch of the security police and SD as a cleansing operation. Uh, sorry. Uh, so-called uh, Zoebron's Aktion, the shooting of 200 men, mostly Jews, on 24th June in the town of Garjde, on the Lithuanian-Prussian border. The Germans conducted this massacre on their own, an unusual circumstance in Lithuania, in terms of what, what happened later. Historian Arunas Bubnis has suggested that since, and let me quote him from his text, the murder of the Jews of Garjde was the first mass murder of Jews in Lithuania, perhaps in the entire Soviet Union. So one can say that the Holocaust, the genocide of Lithuania's Jews, began in Garde, end of quote. Within a few days, the same German unit, now with the increasing support from Lithuanian anti-Soviet partisans and hastily organized local police, killed hundreds more victims in Palanga, Kretinga, Darbene. About 90% of these victims were Jewish men. But this was, of course, not yet a final solution. Far from it. Now, the accounts of the number of Jews killed in the two largest pogroms of the first week of the war in, in Kaunas uh, vary considerably, uh, but we can uh, hazard a guess of about at least 1,000 to 1,500 victims, that is June 25th to 27th. Uh, that might be a reasonable estimate. There is evidence of German instigation in the Viljan Poljak massacre, the Slobodka massacre, and of course German soldiers were observers at Lietukia's garage as you can see in the photographs. There are reports of a number of attacks on Jews in Vilnius as well, the kidnappings of men and the shooting of Jews in Red Army prisoners of war, but there were no contem contemporaneous pogroms of the Kalmus variety in Vilnius. 
smaller scale attacks and individual murders, as well as a pattern of persecution and numerous instances of harassment have been reliably reported. In Wilkowiczkis, which fell to the Germans on the first day of the invasion, the local partisans carried out immediately arrests of suspected communists and Jews. In the Nietzsche, a large band of anti-Soviet insurgents seized control of the town before the Germans arrived and arrested the communists, including many uh, Komsomol activists, as well as Jews, some of whom were reportedly shot. In Pilvishke, several Jews were reported killed during the first days of the invasion. Uh, Jewish refugees were harassed, and some were killed as they fled east. So combining all of this together, we can assume that at least somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 Jews had died in pogroms and selective mass executions, two very different methods of murder, such as in Berchleif, when I talk about selective mass killings. Some were killed before the German troops arrived, but this was not the prevailing pattern. As my colleague Christoph Dietmann and I have concluded, the assertions found in some sources of 10,000 victims of spontaneous pogroms at some 40 locations in Lithuania could seem to be considerably off the mark. I should add here also that the earliest attacks on Jews commenced under unusual circumstances, unparalleled elsewhere in Europe. What this meant in Lithuania, invasion and insurrection, political revolution at the same time in the first week of the war, massacres by the retreating Red Army in large numbers, armed clashes of local communists and Komsomol activists with the anti-Soviet partisans, this was all part of the chaotic violence gripping the country, which claimed many non-Jewish civilians as well. For example, nine suspected Lithuanian Soviet collaborators were shot on 28 June by the newly formed local police in Kudirkos Naumistis in Shake district, including a 15-year-old boy whose crime was leading the local chapter of the pioneers, as you know, the Soviet youth organization. There are reports of rebels killing communists on the first days of the war also in the Lipas, and instances of such murders in eastern Lithuania before the Germans arrived. The circumstances, however, of anti-Semitic violence changed drastically as the Nazi occupation authorities proceeded to secure the country. I have some statistics just for uh, looking at the other killings that occur in the first week to emphasize my point that this first wave of violence of the first week <coughs> until July 3rd occurs under very unusual circumstances which, which are not easily found in the rest of Europe. The sort of chaotic revolution, political violence, the fight for independence and all the rest which is happening at the same time, and which is also killing several thousand non-Jewish civilians, uh, including German punitive actions, massacres by the Red Army and KVD, here near Kalmas, of course, uh, on, on, on June 26th. Now, but this changes uh, because we now enter a period from organized persecution and selective killing to something else. <coughs> According to Christoph Dieckmann, who has written the most comprehensive history of the German occupation of Lithuania, quote, all the pogroms of larger scale, he means, of course, Lietukis, uh, that took place in Lithuania can be traced to German initiative. In almost all cases, the violence escalated after the arrival of the Germans. As a result, Professor Dieckmann concludes that, quote, the isolation, expropriation, robbery, and murder of the Jews now became systematized in a way in which it had not been before. With the assertion of control by the Germans and the reestablishment of Lithuanian local police and civil authority, the nature of the violence changed. While the arrests of suspected communists continued, the overwhelming majority of victims were now Jewish men. Organized massacres by militarized police formations under Nazi command and control became the rule, and these killings escalated markedly during the month, month of July. On 4th and 6th July, here in the 7th, 4th and Kalmas, nearly 3,000 Jews were murdered, mostly men. In Vilnius, 321 Jews were killed on July 8, 1941, and then mass shootings in Panere began a few days after this resulting in some 5,000 victims by the end of the month of July. On 2nd July in Tauragé, this aforementioned German uh, Tinsa unit killed 133 mostly Jewish men, uh, and so on. On 3rd July, um, the uh, same unit, along with many Lithuanian auxiliaries, killed 322 persons in Yurubarkas, mostly men, of whom an estimated 250 were Jews uh, of this number. And we see a pattern here as well of the increasingly 
numerous participation, uh, not of Germans, but of Lithuanian auxiliaries and police during this July wave of killings. It becomes a pattern. <clears throat> um, there are scores of instances of shootings of Jews, primarily men in provincial towns. A horrendous exception to this prevailing pattern of killing mainly Jewish men, an exception to this, was what occurred in mid-July in Vlunga, in Jamitia, uh, where following a period of intense persecution, this very historic Jewish community, some 1,800 Jewish men, women, and children were murdered in a nearby village in Kaushiene. This was the largest scale July massacre in the provinces of the month of July. The killers were the local Lithuanian auxiliaries, um, the so-called white, arm ba white armbands, Balkaresti, who carried out the murders with only a few Germans reportedly supervising the action. In sum, the organized persecution and shooting of Jews and suspected communists between the outbreak of the war and the beginning of August resulted in the deaths of approximately 20,000 civilians, of whom at least 85 to 90 percent were Jews. But this was a prelude, this was but a prelude actually, to the lethal blow against the Jewish community which followed this month of July. Do we talk now about a transition to genocide is one of the questions that historians have discussed lately in several articles and books. I would like to address this uh, briefly. Uh, at the beginning of August of 1941, about 90% of Lithuania's Jews were still alive. That is, <coughs> five to six weeks after the beginning of the war. <coughs> In mid-August, the chief of the Lithuanian police department here in Kaunas, Vitotas Regitas, in my own opinion, the highest ranking Lithuanian war criminal of all time, sent a circular to police precincts in western Lithuania, ordering the immediate roundup of all Jews suspected of communist activities for transport to undisclosed locations. But it was clear from the document itself, and from the context in which it was issued, that this was actually a, one of the operational uh, stages of what followed as the destruction of almost entire provincial Jewry in Lithuania in 1941. On 15 to 16 August, the Germans and their Lithuanian auxiliaries massacred the Jews in Rokishkis on a scale a fair to unprecedented in the province. The wave of extermination that culminated in the great action in Kaunas began in the Gebit Commissariat of Cholet and then proceeded in a wide arc towards the southwest. In retrospect, these events signaled the beginning of the end of Lithuanian Jewry in the countryside. This history, I'm sure, to many of you is well known and can be summarized on the basis of the infamous Jaeger report and other sources. Uh, some statistics. Uh, now, uh, I would like to hear, you see this thing at the top says with errors. Uh, this is what historians should do when they make a mistake, they should correct it. And my uh, friend and colleague, Christopher Diekman, when I first showed him this chart, he said, Solo, he said, you're, you're wrong. Uh, this is not right. Because the first two colors, which are the yellow and, and green there, uh, would indicate in the chart a number approaching something like, oh, no, four or five thousand. But in reality, and he is persuasive on this point, if we take uh, the period until August 1st, that is, if we take all of July into account, that bar on the left should be way up. Uh, to include those first of those first periods, these are in two week increments. As you see, these are two week increments. This chart, um, and so even at this late date, we, we are revamping and we are re uh, researching anew some of the figures and some of the ways in which we understand how this came about. Um, uh, and you can see here, and I've uh, uh, oh the next one. Uh, or actually, uh, I marked with an asterisk the Jaeger report, which actually contains some omissions, because there are places where the EK3 did not operate, uh, particularly on the border zones in the east, where it was Einsatzkommando 9, where, which are not included in these figures. And so the, the, you have to expand them somewhat to, uh, to, to look at them that way. So uh, the, the top two I, I marked as, as, as uh, uh, these are not based on the Jaeger report, but on other sources uh, that we have. Um, now, <clears throat> In the end, uh, the International Commission, uh, which I am a part, has concluded that the Holocaust in Tway resulted in an estimated between 200,000 to 206,000 deaths overall. About 190,000 were Lithuanian Jews, that is, either citizens of the Republic or when 
of the Polish occupied regions were taken in in 1939, would include permanent residents of Lithuania of Jewish ancestry. Uh, of these, three fourths died in 1941 in the operation I have, have described. Um, <clears throat> Um, here we have some of the things I had been talking about. Uh, this is a little bit out of order uh, presentation, as you can see. Um, and this is, of course, the famous uh, Yatukas garage, as you can see. Okay. Now, um, talk a little bit about the uh, Nazi decision to engage in mass murder as opposed to selective murder, two different forms. Um, rather than the selective massacres they had carried out throughout July. Now, except the exception of Plungia, of course. Uh, and, and some historians have briefly, I can just point out, several causal theories of why the decision is made uh, to kill all Jews, not just selected targets. One is the euphoria of victory thesis, put forth by Christopher Browning in, in a book, which says that the uh, Germans uh, were so ecstatic in the success at the beginning of the war that they pushed towards solving all of their problems at once, particularly since this was, again, after all, also a war against Jews themselves, not just. Uh, by far. But there's an opposite notion that I think is more convincing, and that is that very early in the invasion in Operation Barbarossa, German leaders understood that their blitzkrieg had failed, and they were now confronted with a much longer war which they had not anticipated, and therefore they had to deal with useless eaters and all the other problems that were behind the lines. Um, whatever one's views, it is clear that the es escalation and mass murder of Jews of all of Europe I think impacted Lithuania first. Jürgen Matthaus has suggested that the massacre of 3,200 Jews in the Rokishkis on 15 August, he is quoted as saying, Mark de Cesura, a turning point in the history of the Holocaust, that one action. Uh, and significantly, if you look at the 1941 Jaeger report on the Rokishkis, you find the first mention of a word that does not appear before this, you find the word Judenkinter. And after that, if you look at the Jaeger report following, he becomes an accountant of this mass murder by classifying his victims as men, women, and children in exact numbers. So there's some argument to be made that this was a turning point in how they were going to approach uh, the, the solution of the so, the so-called solution of the Jewish question. In an article recently by Alex Kay, a British scholar living in Germany, uh, he traces the key moment in this evolution earlier and argues that Einsatzkommando 9, which operated in eastern Lithuania and western Belarus, uh, began in late July to include women in massive numbers among the victims, and later also children. And he traces this to a decision made apparently in Berlin. Uh, he, he cites Reinhard Heydrich as the source of this order. Uh, he concludes that, quote, it is likely that in mid-July, the decision was taken to expand the scope of the killing operations to include the whole of Soviet Jewry, and that was followed by the planning for what happened that I just described in August and after that. The consequences of this turn of events can hardly be overestimated. Without this quantum leap in mass murder, we would not today be holding a conference on the Holocaust. We might be discussing how Lithuania's summer of 41 constituted another historic wave of persecution, such as Khmelnytsky, Russian Civil War. So the Holocaust did not begin in that day. What happened in Rokishkas, however, forces us into considering some specific features of the final solution of Khmer from a European perspective. We should briefly consider how the necessary historical elements uh, which resulted in the final solution came together in the case of Lithuania and suggest what this might imply for our understanding of the Holocaust. First on anti-Semitism. As Timothy Snyder has argued in an essay entitled Commemorative Causality, anti-Semitism is a necessary but insufficient causal condition to explain the Holocaust. If, as he notes, the Holocaust, if that was so, the Holocaust should have begun in Germany in the 1930s, but it's not. Racial anti-Semitic propaganda long preceded the persecution of the Jews in the Reich and became official policy in 1933, as you know. In Lithuania, however, Nazi racial ideology resonated among a small radical fringe but had little currency in the general, populace, general population. A surge of anti-Semitism arose during the searing experience of the Soviet occupation of 1940 to 41. 
rather than racial ideology. The lethal conflation of Jews with Bolshevism weaponized anti-Semitism in Lithuania and became the legitimizing rationale for the killers at the pits. On 4 July 1941, the editorial in the newspaper Noyoye de Tova declared that, quote, the new Lithuania, having joined Adolf Hitler's New York, must be clean from the mud of Jewish communism to annihilate Jewry and with it communism is the first task of the new Lithuania, end of quote. This is, uh, this is uh, in the Lithuanian language for those of you who can read the uh, extract of the phrases published in uh, July 4th, uh, 1941. Uh, as you can see. Uh, so, uh, and this is in, in bigger letters, the key sentence in that uh, it was kind of an editorial uh, op-ed piece in that, in that paper that day. Uh, <clears throat> the official anti-Semitism of the provisional government, like in Louis Vuitton, and especially the rabid anti-Jewish propaganda which poured out in the press constitutes the most shameful episode in the history of Lithuanian nationalism. It should be noted, however, the difference from Germany. Official and public anti-Semitism did not precede the initial attacks on Jews, as it did in Germany, but, but emerged in the immediate aftermath of the violence, escalated during the destruction, and took on racial themes only after most of the Jewish community had been destroyed. So the causal link here is, is a little bit weaker than it would be elsewhere. A direct causal link between the level of anti-Semitism and the intensity of violence is not always evident. The level of Jew hatred in Venice, for example, for, from what we see in diaries and newspaper publications and what people are talking about is documented, the level of Jew hatred in Venice was no less than in Columbus. I would argue even more so. And yet the former city, Venice, did not witness the pogroms on a scale we saw in Viliampur and Yatugas. Why not? I don't have a very easy answer for this. This is also the case if we take a European-wide approach, however, also. In Hungary and Romania, which had a long history of official anti-Semitism during the 1930s, the percentage of Holocaust survivors was considerably higher than in Lithuania and Ukraine, where pre-World War II, uh, before the war, there was no official anti-Semitism as such, of the kind you saw in Hungary, Romania, Germany, and elsewhere. France, with a long history of ideological anti-Semitism, which became official under Vichy, lost roughly a quarter of its Jewish population. And many of these were foreign Jews, foreign-born Jews, not French citizens. By contrast, the Netherlands, with an assimilated Jewish population and a tradition of tolerance, lost almost three-fourths of the Jewish community in Holland, who were deported to death camps with the assistance of the Dutch constabulary police. I think Hungary's example is especially informative. The death of the majority of Hungarian Jews was the result, of course, of the March 1944 German invasion and the installation of the Arrow Cross puppet regime. Even though Jews in Hungary had been horribly persecuted under Horthy and were in camps and exploited for labor, that final stage of destruction was not in, in, the, in the policy of the Hungarian government under the Admiral. This suggests that in those regions of Europe where most Jews perished, the degree of German control in a given area, rather than ideological fervor, proved the most decisive factors in explaining why the relative rates of Jewish death and survival varied so much by different by country. The Jews of Germany's Axis allies, uh, I take this from a number of sources uh, where there were published estimates of rates of survival. The Jews of Germany's Axis allies stood about a 50% chance of survival. That's Hungary, Romania, France, and, uh, uh, not so much Croatia, of course. By contrast, only approximately 1 in 20 Jews of, in Poland and the Baltic states lived to see the end of the war. I think the contrast in these rates is, is remarkable. Now, some operational aspects of the final solution in Lithuania. <coughs> The operational stages of destruction, as defined by Hilbert, can still be perceived in Lithuania if we look closely. The lengthy, legalized, bureaucratic process of classifying Jews in Mishinia within the right proved unnecessary in the East, where assimilated Jews were in the minority. Most so-called post-Juden 
were easily recognizable by dress, speech, religious affiliation, and in some cases appearance, and the documentation as well, because in the official documentation of Interroll Lithuania, one's nationality and religious affiliation were usually listed in your identity papers. Furthermore, German officials issued guidelines after the first week legally identifying Jews on the basis of the Nuremberg racial law. In fact, the document we have by the German commandant in Lithuania listing and explaining who was a Jew is the very first the racist official document in the history of this country. Uh, in Lithuania, these were the first racial statutes in history. In contrast to the Reich, the Jews of Lithuania were robbed and stripped of rights within weeks. It didn't take the years that it took in Germany. They were concentrated in the three big ghettos and isolated in many smaller ghettos, most of which were simply temporary camps awaiting destruction. The manner and speed of implementing policies differed from the experience in the Reich, but it is difficult to argue, in my opinion, that in principle the processes of destruction were dissimilar. <clears throat> the most salient feature in the annihilation of the Jews of the Baltic states and Ukraine is the extensive participation of a significant part of the local population. In his Black Earth, the recent book, Snyder advanced the notion that aside from the German decision, no Hitler, no Holocaust theme, which is often put forth by historians, aside from the German decision to murder the Jews of Europe, an important factor facil facilitating the final solution was the destruction of independent states between Germany and Russia and the shattering impact of foreign occupation on civil society. Naturally, Jews had different experiences of citizens in Poland and the Baltic states, but as long as they remained citizens, they were protected from annihilation. A very important factor, and to my mind, and not studied enough and not appreciated enough, this factor, in the policy of murder in Lithuania was the availability of armed men with military experience on an unusual scale. Many came from the anti-Soviet partisans or the soldiers of the former Red Army 29th Rifleman's Corps, the majority of whom had deserted or mutinied at the outbreak of the war. The 29th uh, Rifleman's Corps consisted of several divisions, and it's estimated that only about a fifth of them actually moved east. The others either mutinied or deserted on the spot. Uh, so you have a massive pool of manpower which is trained, knows how to use weapons, and is uh, attuned to military discipline. <coughs> The provisional government's call for the reestablishment of pre-Soviet administrative and police structures met with considerable success. The Germans succeeded in utilizing a substantial part of this new source of manpower as early as 30 June, and executions carried out here in Holmes, as evident in the report of one Erich Erlinger, uh, co commander, the colonel who commanded Sunday Commander 1B, where he talked about using one of the companies of uh, this newly formed battalion for executions. Christoph Diekmann points out the case of Toragie, quite interesting. Seventy men were selected for police service in July in Toragie. Only 17 had not served in the army. So what you have really is an immediate uh, setup of a, a very large group of armed men uh, trained who could be used for the horrible genocide which followed, of course, in the summer and fall of 1941. Needless to say, this, dis this development greatly facilitated the destruction of Lithuania's provincial <coughs> jury. By themselves, none of the indigenous power structures in Lithuania possessed the requisite resources or centralized authority, these were after, after all occupied countries, to exercise the kind of command and control functions necessary to accomplish the final solution. While the provisional government claimed such authority, unlike the Ustasi regime in Croatia, it was never in a position to exercise power on the national level, and most of its decrees and directives were in fact never carried out. However, local organs of Lithuanian administration were instrumental in the persecution and eventual annihilation of the Jews. The situation was different in Poland. The spectrum of Polish responses to Jewish suffering would be recognizable in all of the occupied countries, from rescue to sympathy, then to indifference, hostility, even murder, the spectrum of responses. Certainly, the behavior of many Polish Gentiles left much to be desired. Some betrayed Jews to the Germans, while the so-called blue police did their share in persecuting the Jews. <coughs> Even so, there is one reality with a difference which stands out. Nine-tenths of Poland's Jews were indeed annihilated, but most died at the hands of people who were not Poles. This stands in sharp contrast 
to what transpired here in the Ninth Fort, where most of the victims died at the hands of indigenous collaborationist units, albeit under German command. In conclusion, uh, regardless of similarities with other mass murders in which history abounds, uh, this <coughs> uh, Holocaust in the Twain stands out as the single greatest atrocity of the war years in this region. It is unique in both extent and unique in intent. For this reason, the subject deserves an intensely regional approach by researchers with analytics, analytical skills. At the risk of sounding a discordant note here at the end, let me emphasize why this is important. That the scholars who will be speaking at this conference have skills which are not found in what we call sometimes the West. Uh, and when, once again, I, I quote Timothy Snyder here. Uh, and he quotes this. Uh, uh, so we can go from here to. Uh, go. He wrote in his book, in this essay, no historian of the Holocaust who was significant in 1989 took the trouble to learn an East European language thereafter, despite the incredible availability of sources in the lands where the Holocaust took place. As you well know, since 1990-91, the situation has changed dramatically. Here in this country alone, it, just to point out, there are probably, I would guess, and maybe Dr. Uh, Rochanos could correct me, but I would say there are at least several hundred thousand pages of documentation in the Lithuanian language of local government and police structures, which are absolutely essential in understanding how the process happened. Without reading or being able to use this documentation, you cannot write a academic history of the Holocaust. It's sort of like asking people to write a history of Vichy France without knowing a single French word. Uh, no one in the West would take such a study seriously. And so I'm very hopeful that this new wave of scholars, some of them, most of them, much younger than myself, uh, I'm glad to report, uh, will be able to do this work uh, increasingly and focus on local history. Uh, this problem of not learning an East European language is, of course, uh, not relevant for most of the presenters at this conference who come from this new generation of scholars and so on. Uh, it is important to listen to them because their work will undoubtedly expand our understanding of the Holocaust in yet unforeseen ways. I want to finish with where I began. Uh, these are the children of Collins, and I think that it's behooves all of us who take an academic interest in mass murder that we can't forget the actual individual pain and suffering of people, you see. Uh, and <clears throat> again, another, another photograph. I end with a quote from Voltaire, because, you know, I come back to the point that, well, anti-Semitism was not a sufficient cause of the Holocaust, it was a necessary precondition. And uh, it's, of course, an absurd ideology, uh, hateful and to be condemned. And as Voltaire once said, uh, those who can make you believe absurdities can also make you commit atrocities. And with that uh, thought, I will leave you and uh, wish you all to have a productive and uh, uh, hopefully illuminating conference. Thank you very much.